Thanks very much, Ken. Um, that was a wonderful uh, economics lesson for those out who are listening um, to this discussion tonight. Uh, let me first ask, uh, thank Sue Richardson for the enormous amount of work that she's done to make this happen and to thank all the fellows that I've been working with on this report. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a, a more detailed discussion of how you might actually go ahead and implement the sort of principles that Ken has just outlined. Uh, a number of the fellows were asked to get together and come up with a, a, a design of a system and we come up with something that we should call CALM, C-A-L-M, stands for the Climate Asset and Liability Mechanism. Uh, this is based on um, a number of different approaches designed by Australian economists, uh, Rosalind Dixon and Richard Holden, um, my own work with Peter Wilcoxon in the US at Brookings, and Mike Young. Uh, and we got together, we took the various parts of our various approaches and came up with what we thought was a design which could be implemented in the Australian context. We based this design on five principles. Um, firstly, we wanted to address the economic, social and environmental costs of emissions based on scientific evidence. So we want to start with the scientific basis. We want to utilise market-based mechanisms that minimise cost, encourage and reward innovation and promote investment. Uh, we want a princ principle that enables business and consumers to invest with confidence through policy certainty. Uh, you, you really cannot underestimate the importance of policy certainty in a world dominated by climate uncertainty. And so this is a key aspect of why uh, the approach that Ken outlined is, is a way to move forward. The fourth principle is to support an adjustment process that is fair to Australian households. And the final uh, principle uh, was to be mindful of the regional impacts and consider place-based policies. So there are two goals in designing the specifics of this system. Um, firstly, the idea that em emitting activities should incur the liabilities for their emissions. So this is where the liability side of CALM comes from. Um, the second part is the, the, allocation, the allocation of the right to emit, which is an asset, and its price should be set in a market framework to achieve the emissions target at minimum economic costs. So the idea is to combine the environmental outcome with least cost uh, economic framework. Now in core of the policy design, you need to take into account the timeframes we're talking about. We're talking about short-term economic costs and we're talking about long-term uh, environmental damage and potentially long-term economic benefits of taking action. Um, and really this is a question of designing policy uh, to deal with risk. And we want to manage the short-term risks differently from the long-term risks. So that is critical in the design of a framework is to manage the risks of climate change. Um, the policy framework that we have designed is, has to be flexible. Um, for example, if there's a technological breakthrough that makes it much cheaper to reduce emissions more quickly than uh, would have been thought in design of the policy, then that action should be taken. An alternative is if fewer countries take action or costs in Australia are much higher than predicted, then you need a mechanism for slowing the emission reductions um, to, to minimise economic costs. The key issues that need to be balanced is um, the imposition of the li liability uh, is going to be a cost to existing economic activities. So current firms that emit will be bearing a cost. Um, but the alternative uh, side of this is that long-term emission prices are actually an opportunity for innovation and for new enterprises to emerge. So pricing gives you both costs and benefits, and the idea is to bring them into a market-based framework. So very simply, how does CALM work? Well, the idea is to take um, what Ken has just talked about, um, take the best features of emissions trading system and carbon pricing models um, generally. And you'd start firstly with a commitment by the government of an emissions goal of zero net emissions by 2050, and the path that uh, they expect to achieve this particular goal. Then you would create a carbon bank. And the role of a carbon bank is firstly to record the annual emissions of large polluters, uh, to create annual emission certificates, which equal, equal the government target, uh, to require all large emitters and to hold annual certificates, the assets, to match their emissions, which are the liabilities on their balance sheets. Uh, then to bundle these emission certificates, each of which has a particular year attached to it, to create what we call a carbon bond. So just like a government bond, which has an uh, annual interest payment, a carbon bond would have an annual right to emit. And then the final role, and this is very critical, which moves this approach somewhat away from the standard ideas of carbon market trading um, of emission permits, is that the, central, the carbon bank would sell additional certificates 
uh, into the certificate market at a fixed price. This eliminates volatility in the annual market and it caps short-term economic costs. So this, this is a broad design. Um, how would you begin? Well, firstly, the government would allocate at the very commencement of the program, all carbon bonds. So all households, firms, everybody in the Australian economy would be subject to receiving an allocation. The government would create the markets to trade these certificates, to trade the carbon bonds, and these would naturally create futures markets for trading future certificates. What this generates is a price of carbon between now and 2050, much like we have in the bond market, where we have a yield curve for interest rates, we can now have a yield curve for carbon prices. Futures car these future carbon prices will drive investment. They'll drive innovation. And it will be a well-regulated market, regulated by the carbon price, with absolute certainty of the price in the short term and a market framework for setting the price over time. What are the advantages? Well, Ken has touched on many of these. Um, firstly, you set very clear long-term price signals for consumers and firms to reduce emissions through modifying ex existing activities and undertaking new investment. A short-term carbon price with no knowledge of the future price of carbon is really a cost. But a market-based mechanism that delivers a long-term futures carbon price creates an enormous opportunity uh, and will drive innovation, will bring ideas to market, will enable um, much greater certainty uh, in investment in Australia. You'll get very clear signals from uh, new information uh, if there's a climate event or there's some development in international negotiations, the markets will price this far more quickly than governments can change their own policy. So therefore, this, using the market to signal to uh, consumers and firms is much better than having uh, to, regu to have parliamentary meetings to change regulations and legislation. Very importantly, what this also does is it creates a political constituency to support the continuation of the policy. Once these long-term rights are allocated, uh, companies who are possibly fossil fuel intensive but now have uh, long-term bonds on their balance sheet will face opposite incentives to block the policy. On the one hand, <clears throat> on the one hand their carbon assets will be um, under threat, um, whereas their um, calm assets will be um, offsetting those on the balance sheet. So they have different incentives to, to support the policy. And finally, um, this allocation of carbon bonds has the capacity to increase the wealth of Australian households and consumers as well as companies who receive them. Uh, it, this is more than enough wealth created to offset, offset the short-term costs of the policy uh, through uh, electricity prices and other carbon uh, intensive asset prices. So it, you have a capacity here to compensate at the same time as creating a very powerful incentives for innovation, for investment, and for reaching those long-term carbon goals, uh, which are absolutely necessary for the Australian economy and the world economy going forward. And I will end there. Thank you.